Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to Friday Coffee Chat. Thank you for giving me a week off last week. <laughs> I feel like I just sat down and was like, what is happening with my hair? I have like a couple curls here, but this has completely uncurled itself. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> just brush it. I don't know what to do. Throw this part back and just leave this little curl. I don't know. <laughs> Yay. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Shell says, my birthday starts in a few hours. Yay. Happy birthday, Chels. All right. How's everybody doing? It has been a week of rest for me. Um, a bit of a difficult emotional week for me. So I am very much looking forward to spending this hour with you all and hanging out. I spent a little bit of time today thinking about joy and creating our own rules for success. We're going to talk about that a little bit today as well. And we're going to talk about the eclipse coming up. Oh, it's Jazz's birthday. Oh my gosh. Please tell her happy birthday from me. That's so sweet. Your Hello Kitty strawberry milk shirt is cute. This is from Five Below. I have no idea what this actually says, but it's cute. It's so cute. I love it. Um, and it was very inexpensive. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Just trying to read and catch up on all of the, uh, oh no, Renee has to leave. Okay. Kiddo needs a ride to work. That's important. Have a safe drive and we will see you later. Um, you missed nothing. You missed nothing. You missed just a hello, hello, hello. Um, today when I was thinking about joy and rest and things like that, you know, something that I think we don't talk about enough, really, is that, you know, productivity is good. I, we love productivity. I, I love productivity. And I like being busy. I'm somebody who just enjoys being busy and always having something that I'm working toward and all of that. But at the same time, uh, sometimes I think once we've been in a habit of go, go, go all the time, it can be easy to forget to just allow ourselves to not be productive a little bit. And I feel like, especially if you're a writer or you're somebody who works for yourself as an entrepreneur or something like that, there's always something else you can be doing. And really, even if it's not your job, even if you work a normal nine to five job, you come home, there's always something more that you can be doing, right? There's always some, some, uh, you know, what's this rest of which you speak, Jenna says. Exactly. Um, it's like, there's always more laundry to do. There's always more cleaning you could do. There's always something else you could organize. There's always another set of, you know, bookcases or something that isn't organized right, or it's not, um, you know, something that like you got to do outside of the house or papers you need to fill out. It's just, there's always, always, always something to be done. And that is a good thing and a bad thing because I think sometimes it feels, especially the older I get, you can tell me if you feel that this is true. The older I get, it feels more luxurious or selfish to spend time just hanging out on my own, doing something that's not multitasking or productive in some way for the future. And even though over the past year, I have tried to actually put stuff in my schedule to be like, this is my reading time, or this is going to be my take a bath time or self-care time. I off, I often find it, <laughs> oh, so I'm going to bring this up in a second. I often find it to be difficult for me to not want to multitask. Like if we're going to sit down and watch a movie. I want to have my planner there so I can like get it settled, like some, something else I was supposed to do, even if it's just putting washi tape on the pages and stickers down. So it'll save me time later. Or if we're going out to a baseball game and I know there's going to be 20 minutes while the boys are warming up before it's time to go, I've got to have my Kindle scribe there and I've got to be annotating books or I've got to be like answering somebody's questions or, um, you know, a million other things. I think this is funny. I have a hard time resting moon and Virgo. So my moon is Pisces, which I am not even sure exactly what that does like for me, but my rising sun is Virgo. And I think that that has a lot to do with my productivity uh, obsessions as well. And it's, I, I, I feel like 
it's not necessarily a bad thing to want to be productive. Like, I don't think that we should shame people either because it's all about personal preferences and what brings you joy, which is why I wanted to talk about embracing joy a little bit today. Um, because we're all different and because we're different and we often now have access to literally everyone else's lives and watching what they do. Sometimes we don't just number one, let other people be themselves. And number two, just let ourselves be who we are. And I think one of the most powerful things that we can do for ourselves and for each other is just to learn to accept ourselves as we are, especially leaning into the things that we enjoy about ourselves and the things we enjoy doing. And then trusting ourselves to know these are the things I don't love about myself or the things I want to change about myself in terms of, you know, I, it maybe you like to rest a lot and you wish you were a little bit more motivated. But where that becomes complicated is that you don't want to think I need to be more motivated because other people think I should be more motivated or because other people think I need to change. It's so much more powerful to lean into what is it I truly want. And some of this goes hand in hand with this idea of creating our own rules for success. Because I think that we often just assume there's sort of one rule for success and success looks like this, right? So sometimes if we look at people who are super successful, they make six figures a year, they uh, have this perfect house and they have, you know, whatever, they're married and they have two kids or, you know, whatever. We say, this is the ideal and we point to it and we say, I wish I could be more like that because that's what a successful author looks like or that's what a successful mom looks like or, you know, whatever. But the truth is like, that's just one example out of millions, if not billions of examples of what a successful person looks like. It's like marriage doesn't make you successful and not being married doesn't make you unsuccessful. Being super productive doesn't always make you successful. And being someone who likes to live a more chill life doesn't make you unsuccessful. But we just as a society sort of have these things for years and years that we've pointed to and said, oh, that's what success looks like. And I think those definitions of success come out of an antiquated sort of way of being where there wasn't an internet. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. But we are <laughs> not, not me sitting here planning next week while watching coffee chat, but doesn't that make you happy to do it? So like, I love to sit down and make a plan, what George calls a planner nest. I like to make a planner nest. I have a bunch of different planners and my little caddy and I have my pens and my stickers and I'll turn YouTube on and I'll watch some other planner or I'll watch a podcast, um, like a interview or something like that. And I love it. It makes me happy, but where it becomes a, like, there's a fine line between that makes me happy and it brings me joy. And it feels like my self-care time to like sit down and do the washing tape and whatever, where it becomes like a thing that crosses a line for me is when I need pure rest and I don't allow myself to have it. So yes, <laughs> since social media where we've added more expectations of ourselves, we see what's possible. We feel like we're not living up to our potential. We also feel like other people are more successful or other people are getting more, or we think I know I'm capable of that if I just worked a little bit harder and all of this stuff is, has truth to it. Also, do you see this? Who had these when you were a kid? Little glitter bracelets. It matched my shirt so well. I had to put them on. Uh, George and I had gone a, like a couple of months ago to a, uh, what's it called? What's the Dave and Buster's? We've been to a Dave and Buster's for anybody that doesn't know what this is. It's like a restaurant that also has a bowling alley in it, but it also has an arcade like gaming stuff that you can uh, go through and buy, you buy a card and you play a bunch of games. And then at the end you have tickets that you can turn in for stuff. And George and I had done that on a date night and we had like 7,000 tickets or something like that. And we were looking for stuff to buy with it. But most of the stuff in those little ticket stores is kind of like junky stuff. So I was like looking for something to get for Evie and something for Andrew. And we were just kind of looking around and they had these like glitter bracelets. They're so cute. <laughs> so I got one each for gummy bracelets. Okay. Um, George, I got one of each of these colors for me and one for Evie. Although I have to say it's like it, it, 
it barely fits, but it does. It does fit. <laughs> So I'm counting it as a win. And I got these lovely flowers today from um, Books. So I had to bring those in here. Um, I have three full vases. Every time they deliver the flowers, I can get three vases out of them. So I brought them in here so you guys could see those. But anyway, I thought that it was distracting me when I was talking with my hands. <laughs> but I think, it, I don't know if I'm going to say this exactly perfectly, but I think you understand what I'm saying in that embracing who we are naturally, whether it's productive or more chill, or whether it's, you know, an introvert, extrovert, planner person, not a planner person, fly by the seat of your pants, like what brings you joy and being giving ourselves permission to lean into that as much and as often as possible. Like George and I, um, you know, we first, when we first met, I was living in <laughs> an RV and then in an apartment because I had had, I had been through two complete house fires, like total loss house fires. The first one, the first one wasn't a total loss. I didn't lose everything I owned, but I lost most things that I own. And if you've ever been through a fire, you know, that part of it is that you lose everything you own to smoke damage and water damage almost more than if the fire doesn't take everything. And so that first fire, oh, I had no clothes of my own. I was teaching elementary school um, I was going through a trial for sexual assault, like so many different things were going on in my life at that time. Then that following almost Christmas, the house burned again. So how close were the house fires? The first one happened September, Labor Day of, I'm not going to remember the exact years, but I think 2005. So September, 2005, the second house fire was December, 2006. That doesn't seem right though. I think that was back that up another year, but I, I can't remember. So we're somewhere in there, 2004, 2006, but it, they were about a year apart. And the, the reason they were so close together is because the insurance company was paid or paid the contractors to replace all of the wiring in the house and they did not do that and so the burned wiring in the attic sparked a second fire and it was a miracle that second time that we survived it because it happened in the middle of the night and the fire marshal said that if the ceilings had not been like 15 foot ceilings we would have died because we would have there was that fire had been burning in the attic for so long that there was so much of that like smoke in the air that we would have never woken up. And like, I literally just grab, like I, I grabbed one thing out of my closet. And by the time we were running out the door, like I was in pajamas. So I grabbed like one, like jean jacket or something to throw over me and ran out the door. And by the time we were running out the door, the curtains beside the bed where I had just been asleep, like 30 seconds earlier were on fire. So that was wild. So anyway, uh, so that there was a lot like within that one and a half, two year period, there was so much in my life that happened that really was like awakening to me in terms of that. And so when George and I met, I <laughs> he keep popping in. Um, oh, my internet is slow. Ah. I'm not getting any kind of message that my internet is slow at all. Is anybody else seeing me slow? Potential. She caught back up for me. Usually they'll send me a message that says my internet is slow. It worked out. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? We have a total blackout coming on Monday, so we have no idea what's going to happen. Um, so anyway, I, I had been through a lot over that period of time and then also was going through divorce, but I had, I lived in an RV, then moved into an apartment. I had literally nothing that belonged to me. Like I had no clothing, no computers, no nothing. We had just been able to like borrow stuff and we were living in, um, you know, in a, like a furnished apartment. And it was, a, it was a difficult time in my life and going through fights with the insurance company and other things. That's when I met George. <laughs> and so when I moved in with him, I moved in with literally nothing, no, no possessions at all. Um, and he had this tiny little 
uh, he's always like, you always, you always call it such a tiny little place, but we were so happy there, but it was, it was a tiny little place, um, that had very terrible, like wallpaper that we just could not get off and all of those kind of things. But we were, we were very happy there, but I used to have this desire to be able to put things up on the wall. Like I wanted to put, I wanted to put, uh, like an income tracker to be like, let's try to make a hundred thousand dollars this year. I think the very first time we were like, let's try to get to 50 K this year as a couple. Um, and we were trying to like have trackers to say how many words I had written. And I really, I and mean, this is like a really long story short, I guess, like I really wanted to put a bunch of stuff on the walls, but we didn't have a lot of space. So I used a lot of trifold boards that I put um, uh, when I went th like would put in the closet and then pull out and they would have my plotting board on them, or it would be like a big poster board that I would have to put in the closet. Cause we just didn't have wall space in the house to be able to put things on. So this was a very long explanation of the fact that now that we live in a bigger house, I have joked to say that eventually this entire house is just going to be Kanban boards, bookshelves, and calendars, because I just keep putting things on the wall that motivate me because I'm such a visual person. And, you know, there are people that think it's crazy and I don't really care anymore. For a while I was like, oh gosh, is that kind of dumb? I shouldn't put that on the wall, you know, whatever. But in the end, I think part of growth and, and becoming joyful and just living your own life is just starting to realize what is it that helps me be happy? What is it that brings me joy? And how can I embrace that instead of feeling ashamed of it, worrying what other people think, you know, feeling like it's too indulgent or too self like selfish of me to like put things on the wall or, you know, I know that's a bad example of it, but so often we hold ourselves back from the things that we feel would be a true expression of who we are because we're either taught that it isn't something to be proud of, or we're taught it's something that we shouldn't do, or it's something that makes us weird or unique in some way that people don't like. And of course, we don't always have access to just go put stuff all over our walls if we live with other people. But at the same time, there are things that make you as an individual joyful that you are holding yourself back from because you don't allow yourself to just embrace that joy and just go all in on the thing that is fun for you. And sometimes that is related to productivity and success. So when we talk about creating rules for your own success, what I mean by that is sometimes we will hear the same thing over and over and over again, and we begin to believe it. And there can be people who will tell you definitively, you must do this or you won't be successful. And out of fear, we believe that. But often that rule, so to speak, has come from one person said it. So then a lot of people started saying it again. And then a lot of people started repeating it. But it's not necessarily like truth with the capital T. It's just something that people feel like there's been evidence of. But if you look for evidence to the contrary, you'll find that too. So let me give you an example. If you wanted to build a YouTube channel for yourself and you said, or you heard, you know, you watched some classes and were listening to other people about how to build a YouTube channel. You might hear someone very clearly say that you need to have one single niche, that you're only going to be successful if you have one main thing that you talk about. Number two, you need to set a absolute like I, ride or die schedule and be consistent. That consistency is the most important thing that you should post every Tuesday, every Thursday, every Saturday, post as often as possible. Like you'll hear all these different rules and they'll say, if you want to grow, you have to do this. So somebody had recently said to me, if you want to grow, you have to do shorter videos, like seven minute videos is where you're going to find your sweet spot. And you need to stop talking about X, start only talking about Y, you need to do these few things. And that stuff didn't resonate with me. And I started thinking, is that really a rule that I have to post shorter videos more often that are specific to a popular niche? Is that a rule or that's just someone's opinion of what works? If I decided to do something different, could I also grow doing it differently? What's the rules, right? And I think so often we allow ourselves to get pulled into someone else's rules. And often that rule, when we talk about success, is 
do it this way, or you're not going to find your greatest level of success. And I feel like the truer rule (laughs) is as long as you're being true to yourself and you embrace the, your intuition and the things that bring you joyful, like bring you joy, or you're embracing your own, like natural way of being, that's where you'll find your greatest fulfillment. And in that fulfillment, you'll find your success. I mean, there are other YouTubers who have millions and millions of followers, hundred million followers, and that's cool. Maybe I will never get there and that's okay. But that doesn't mean I'm not a success, right? I'm still a massive success because I get to do what I want to do. I get to talk how I want to talk. I get to talk about the things I want to talk about. And there's so many people that love hanging out with me. Like all of y'all are here and I love it. It's so much fun. I was just writing in my journal or reading in my five-year journal about however many years ago, five years ago, which is just like what, four years ago, um, uh, when I was reading The Witch's Key. And I was so excited because there were like 65 people on a live stream. And today we have 230 people on a live stream. And I think it's a matter of what, how do you personally define, define success? Um, and how do you go after it unapologetically? Right. So I don't put ads in my videos in the mid roll, um, on my videos, but So a lot of people will say you have to do, I think they used to make it where it was only 10 minute videos or something like that got ads. And then they shortened it to like seven minute videos can do ads and now you can make money on shorts. So that, that kind of stuff changes all the time anyway. But for me, it's a matter of saying like, you could set a rule for yourself that in order to be successful on YouTube, I have to post every single week and I can't grow unless i make a post every week. And that could be your rule. And it will live up to that because that is what you believe. But you could also set a rule that says, I post when I most feel like it and I still continue to grow. And that feels like a scarier rule to set for yourself because that's not what people tell you is true. They say you have to post consistently. You have to post X, Y, Z, you have to hustle, you have to, you know, whatever. So if I looked at it in terms of books success, people might say, oh, you have to be writing five books a year to be successful as an indie author. I've heard people say you have to be writing six books a year. I've heard people say you cannot, uh, you can't write YA and be successful. Like there's all these invisible rules that people will put on you, but none of it's really true, right? Like right now, a lot of people are very worried and concerned that you have to be writing really sexy books in order to be successful, but that's not true. If you look for that to be true, you might find evidence that is true that a lot of people enjoy sexier books, which is great. Go for it. There's lots of new ones coming on the market, but you can't say that you have to do that to be successful. That's just a limitation that you're placing on yourself because you're afraid that you don't want to write that type of book. And so you don't you're scared that you won't be able to find success. The same way that you could say, I have to post on social media in order to be successful. Some people believe like there's, oh, there's no success if you aren't on social media. But I know authors who aren't on social media at all. They have zero social media presence and they make a million dollars a year. So sometimes we give ourselves rules based on our fears, based on what other people have told us, based on the evidence so far that we've seen that our fears are true, when those aren't actually real truths, they're just rules that society set out for us or rules that we decided were true for whatever reason, because someone told us, because we believed it, because we saw evidence of it once and we think that's going to be the truth forever. And I think instead, number one, Let's start looking at what makes me happy, not what am I doing because it makes the people around me happy, which is also a good and noble thing to do sometimes, but also taking a moment to say, what really brings me joy? If it's plastering stuff all over your wall, go for it. You guys will see if you um, if you watch my 90 day reset routine, which will go up, I don't know, sometime early next week, I have put a giant calendar on my wall. Do I already have a calendar on my wall in a different room? Yes, I do. Did I put another one up? Yes, I did. And I love it. Every time I walk by, it makes me happy. So embrace your joy. 
Another thing that I was thinking about is reading. So I buy books <laughs> almost every week. Almost every week I buy a book. Um, but how often do I actually read a book? In Q1, I read eight books, which is more than I have read in three month period in a long time. Um, and it's a mix of audiobooks, uh, paperbacks, ebooks, nonfiction fiction, eight books. I want to read a lot more than that. I probably buy more books in a year than I read. And I still think somehow I'm going to be able to catch up. But I know that, yeah, buying books and reading books are two different hobbies. I love it. Oh, I got the flowers from Books. Um, it's B-O-U-Q. I don't know where that went. Uh, where'd you get the flowers? Uh, B-O-U-Q apostrophe S. It's a subscription. I love it. Why is this lagging? So <laughs> I got 12 books in Q1 in in Q1 and most of them were Sarah Cannon books. I love that you loved them enough that you were still reading them. Um, but I think that, well, I know, I don't just think, I know that when I was writing all the time, I was also reading all the time. I was also gaming all the time. And I know that my life is different now because when I first started as a writer, I did not have as much responsibility as I have now. I, I All I was doing was writing and I didn't like, there wasn't as much of a push on like advertising and marketing the same way there is now. I didn't have as many books in my backlist to manage and I didn't have children. <laughs> I didn't have, you know, a yard to take care of and stuff like that. Like I have a lot more responsibility. So I know I can't expect myself to just be able to play games, video games all day and read all day. But at the same time, I start, I've started thinking about it today that one of the main reasons that I don't allow myself to just take my Kindle, this is the Kindle Oasis, by the way. Um, yeah, ch and chickens. <laughs> one of the reasons that I'm not allowing myself to do gaming and reading is because I can't multitask as well while I'm doing it. I can't sit and also do my planner. I can't make other decisions. I can't use my brain in two different ways at once. And I'm, I think that for me, this has been a huge reason why I'm not writing as much as I used to. And I had this thought today. So I won't, I'm not, oh no, now it does say I have low internet. If I, if I lag, I apologize. Hopefully it will come back. We will, we will collectively will it to come back. <laughs> um, okay. Hopefully it's better. Uh, so I have this last week. Okay. Let me back up last week. I took Thursday and Friday off because I was like, I think I'm going to be able to finish the book. And I came very close. <laughs> so I went on to Priceline, which is my favorite place to get hotel deals. And, uh, I, you know, I worked on the book all last week and I got to a point where I was like, Oh my gosh, I think I'm going to be at, at like, at the end of this, like rewrite. And so I went on to Priceline. I got a four and a half star hotel, the Hilton Anatole, which is just an incredible, gorgeous, gorgeous hotel that usually is very expensive for $111. And the minute I saw that price tag, 111, I was like, sold, I will take it. Um, and I canceled Twitch stream, I canceled coffee chat. And I was like, I'm just going to indulge myself in full 24 hours of working on this book. And it's going to be amazing. And it was, I got there early. My room was ready early. I had a beautiful room. Um, I got to sit in the sun for a little while. They had picnic tables. I did a vlog, so I'll share with you um, what that re retreat was like. But the weather was absolutely perfect. And I was sitting at a picnic table under this big oak tree and I wrote and wrote and wrote and I got so much done. I got 30,000 words edited and rewritten while I was there. And it was amazing. I stayed up till like three something in the morning. I At one in the morning, I was like, I think I'm going to go to bed. And then I laid down and had so many ideas coming. I got right back up and started working. So it was it was wonderful. And the book is, I was hoping to release, announce a release date today, but I'm not I will announce a release date next Friday. So don't miss next Friday's live stream. But I got really far, woke up the next morning. I had about three hours of sleep, did not eat breakfast, which was foolish and thought, I'm just going to go secure a spot by the pool. And so I went over to the pool, was enjoying the pool. But at this point, I was writing some 
scenes that were more difficult, like emotional scenes towards the end. And I was crying at the pool and like already feeling exhausted. I was dumb and didn't eat, but then I didn't want to lose my spot at the pool. So all that was happening. Then my sister, who is the only person in my family who speaks to me, texted me to say that my uncle Hugh had passed away. And he was older, he's like 83 years old. So it wasn't necessarily unexpected. He had not been in great health, but they had said he was getting better. But it hit me so hard because like way harder than I expected, just because being estranged from your family is complex. There's a lot of complex emotions. And I have been estranged from my family as of this summer, it will be nine years since I've spoken to most of my family. And for me, it was just cutting one person out of my life, but cutting that person out of my life unexpectedly meant everyone else left my life as well. And it was just more heartbreaking and emotional than I expected it to be because my uncle Hugh was somebody I spent almost every day of my life with when I was younger. Uh, we saw each other a lot. He was one of those people that like really, really was a positive mentor and influence on my life. And, you know, when, if you, I remember very clearly reading a book about narcissistic parents. And one of the things that they said is makes the main difference in years of analyzing daughters of narcissistic mothers. One of the main things that makes the difference in whether or not you are able to move on and become someone who goes after your goals and lives the life, you know, of your dreams or is even able to recover from that complex trauma of, of growing up with a narcissistic mother is if you had some core person in your life that believed in you and consistently told you, that you were okay, that you were doing good, that I support you and all of that. And for me, part of that is my dad. My dad was that for me, but it was also my uncle Hugh. And now my aunt Barbara, his wife, that's another story. We won't go into that. Uh, she was not that person. She was always telling me I was never going to make it um, and that I was a terrible person. But regardless, my uncle Hugh was one of those people for me. And he, I think he really made such a positive impact in my life. And I would not be the person I am today if it wasn't for him. And it's such a weird thing because I, I made the choice to step away from that person in my family, my mother, and then everyone else made the choice to step away from me because they chose her to a degree. Um, but partially because it wasn't like when I estranged myself from my mother, I went around to every single person and said, Hey, here's what's going on. Because that didn't feel like that felt very gossipy. And it felt like it just didn't feel aligned for me to go in and, and like tell everyone what was going on, which, you know, what they say is when a narcissist can no longer control you, they control what other people think of you. And that's really what happened in my life is my mother went to everybody in our family and told them all lies about why I had become estranged. And so many of the people that I like, this was probably part of the biggest heartbreak for me when I became estranged from my family was that people that I thought loved me believed that I had done those things. <laughs> I was like, but how could you believe that that's true? But they believe so strongly that my mother is who she portrays herself to be that they just believe her over me. All that to say, I walked away from that pool. <laughs> I was like, like when she sent me the message at first, I was like, gosh, I haven't even, you know, there's always in the back of your mind of like, eventually these people that I have loved my whole life will begin to die, but it's not on your daily thought process. Right. And I saw it felt like I was going to be okay. And then suddenly I was like, I cannot breathe. And I had to just pack up everything. And I was trying so hard just to practice. Like I had to run all the way through the resort, through the hotel, out into the parking lot. And I was like, literally like that sort of choke sobbing myself because I could not control my emotional response to that. And it was so unexpected uh, because I have not had a, like an emotional, like connection like that in a long time. 
And so I sat in my car for a long time. I came home. George loved up on me. The kids loved up on me. We had our, you know, our family unit time. And then it was Easter weekend, but I did not work on the book. I could not work on the book. The next day I woke up and I thought I need to be working. I should be working on the book. And I felt like I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to tell Renee what was going on. I didn't want to call anybody. I didn't want to talk to my sister. And I was like, what is happening? Why can't I be productive? Duh. <laughs> This was like a moment for me where I realized, Sarah, you have got to stop feeling like you have to be made of steel and you have to work all the time to please other people and to make people happy. Like your readers love you and they will be okay with you having a couple of days before you announce the release date. Like it just really, it, it was an eye-opening experience for me because... I realized I don't even want to give myself time to grieve. And it was like, there was a part of me that felt like I don't have a right to grieve because I cut him from my life. Technically, even though that wasn't my intention, that is what I did, right? It was my choice to leave the family. And I don't know if when he passed away, he hated me. He loved me. He never thought of me again. Like I have no idea, but it, because of that, disconnect there's this extreme sorrow of like i can't ex fully express what this means right to me which then brought up so many feelings of like what if it had been my father that died what if it had been my brother which then brought up things i don't even want to like don't even want to think about which then brings up questions of like do i want to continue on and have my dad die and me never have spoken to him again. Like, I don't know if that's what I want, but I don't know if I can actually find a way to have a relationship. So there was just so, so much of, you know, difficulty around that stuff. So I took basically just said, I'm taking the weekend off. Right. Which was obviously the right answer for me. And then, um, I was telling everybody last night on the <laughs> Twitch stream, because we've been making jokes about Groupon. <laughs> it's inside jokes. I know, but we've been making, um, when we've been making jokes about Groupon, I went on to Groupon and was looking for deals for vacation stuff for the summer and saw that Great Wolf Lodge was having a sale on <laughs> yeah, Dr. Groupon. It was just, it just made me laugh. Um, Great Wolf Lodge, which is like an indoor water park and uh, hotel was having a really good deal. So I booked something to surprise the kids with, and we went to Great Wolf Lodge just for one night. And that was so fun and so amazing. And Evie and I spent so much time in the pool she is such a brave little girl. She'll just go down slides head first and all that. She's so different from Andrew. It's so neat to be a parent to, to kids because they have their own personalities and it's fun to watch. Um, and then got home on Monday, which was Q1. And I felt like I needed to be right back into it. Like, oh, okay, I got to announce a release date on Friday and I need to um, – I got like all these videos I need to make and all these different things. And I just – for I was like, why do I feel like doing nothing? I literally just want to sit down and read a book or take a bath or whatever. And again, it was just hitting me of like, I'm not, I don't even allow myself to grieve. So over the past week, I have not been very productive person, <laughs> but I hung that calendar. I spent a lot of time with the kids. Uh, I spent a lot of time outside in the sun. Uh, I spent a lot of time crying because it was, it all came back on Tuesday because I still follow people in my family, like cousins and my sister-in-law on social media. So seeing photos of everyone at the funeral and I'm not there. And it's like, I just, I it's like a ghost just looking in on your life of like, that's, I should be there, right? Like these are my people that I grew up with and I'm not there. I don't exist in their world anymore. And it just made me feel really insignificant and I'm not going to cry on coffee chat, but it's just, it was a complex emotional week. So I, I feel like I learned a lot. I made a donation to the Methodist children's home, which he was part of the board of, which made me at least feel good that I could put some good out into the world in his name. And I have been thinking a lot this week about joy and about peace and about how fleeting life really is and how 
on one hand, we want to make the most of every minute. Like I want to, I want to make this life amazing and I want to live to the best of my ability and I want to live up to my potential and I want to make a big splash in the world and like make a difference and change people's lives. And I want to write all the books and tell all the stories and I want to be the best mom and I want to be a good wife and I want to live in a beautiful house. And like, you know, I, I think I have that pressure because I'm a number three Enneagram. I'm like achiever central. And then on the other hand though, it's like, I also have days where I just think I want to just pick up the Kindle and not have to multitask. I want to just sit down and read a book and not feel guilty about taking time off or not feel like I am losing momentum or I won't gain as many subscribers because I'm not posting enough videos. And so one of the rules, I promise I'm coming back around to something. So thank you. Thank you for hanging out. I hope this has not been a triggering conversation. I should have given a trigger warning before I started talking about loss. Um, but I, I started a series of rules for myself a few weeks ago as part of the Manifestation Babe Academy, which you guys know I've been talking about forever. I, I, I bought that course in 2021 and it is 2024 and I'm still only on module 11 because it has taken me that long to get through this content. But as part of module 10, I started setting diff, like thinking about if I could really and truly create rules for my own life and say that I truly believe that life can be what I make it. It is a massive course. <laughs> it's so big. Um, what would those rules be? And one of the rules that I wrote down for fun for myself is my YouTube channel, meaning heart breathings, continues to grow whether I post or not. And at the time, I was feeling that sort of like, oh man, I only had you know, 300 new subscribers over the last 30 days. And that sucks because I used to get a thousand in a month and it's been slowing down, you know, whatever. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I don't want to make any content right now that feels like I have to make it. I just want to make the content that sounds fun for me. So that's longer videos. And I don't care what anybody else says about, you know, any guru says about writing shorter videos or creating shorter videos. I'm just going to lean into the longer videos, which if you are looking for something to do after this, my HB notebook challenge for April is scheduled to go live right at four, um, which is in 17 minutes. And that is 45 minutes long. <laughs> so I've just been leaning into like what content is fun and only making content when it feels good to me, not forcing myself to do it because I feel like the algorithm needs it. And so I made a rule for myself a couple of weeks ago that I gain subscribers, whether I post a video or not that my backlist content is always changing lives and people are always discovering me and I can, I can post anything I want, anytime I want. I don't have to post to a schedule. I don't have to be consistent. I just am allowed to post when I want to post. And lo and behold, I just had a week and a half that I was not able to post anything at all because I didn't feel like it. And instead of forcing myself out of pressure to make a video that might not have been good energy, I just didn't post and instead waited until a day, which was yesterday, where I felt really good and I was had been out in the sun and I was like, oh, you know what would be fun is to reset my Kanban board today. And I created two new videos yesterday out of nothing but fun energy. And I have gotten over a thousand subscribers in the last like three weeks, even though I haven't posted as much. And it got me thinking about the fact that so often I think energetically we create rules for ourselves that are really based on fear, based on evidence of things that we're scared are true rather than evidence of things that are actually true. And I don't know if this is really resonating or if I'm explaining it exactly right, but I'm just saying like, encourage you to open yourself up to the idea that you are allowed to be happy, <laughs> that you are allowed to pl plaster your walls and fun things to wear Hello Kitty t-shirts, even if people think it's childish to post long videos if that's what you want to do, to never show your face online if you don't want to do that, to give yourself flowers, to, like I was telling George, I've always loved flowers my whole life. Like I just love fresh flowers, flower, you know, fake flowers, anything. It's just, it's something about the color makes me so happy. And I am literally surrounded by flowers right now. Like the blue bonnets in the front yard and the backyard then we have orange flowers. I don't know what they're called. 
Um, let me see if I can find a good photo. It's there's flowers everywhere. And I was sitting there talking to George. So these are my, my roses are blooming like crazy right now. Like, I think it's just from all the rain, like insanely beautiful. And let me see if I can find a picture of the blue bonnets. So funny. I have, I have ones that have the front of my house on it, but I'm going to try to find one that doesn't. Where are you? I know I took so many pictures, but you can, you can kind of see like the blue bonnets are just, it's like a carpet of them. <laughs> carpet. They're so beautiful. I love them. Envy, I do see, I do see your question there. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's important to be able to allow ourselves to engage in what really lights us up. And it's so wild how we often allow ourselves that, oh, the Indian paintbrushes. Yes. I think that is what it is, Gemma. Um, I think that's what my neighbors had called it as well. The orange flowers are really pretty. George is like, I wish we had more of those than we did the blue bonnets, but I love the blue bonnets. They're so pretty. Um, but I think often what starts is a spark of like, I want to be a writer. Ooh, I want to start this bookstagram account. Ooh, I want to do this fun Etsy shop. Something that starts as a spark of fun very quickly in this day and age of the internet where everything is monetizable and everything is comparable to other people quickly becomes something that feels more of a chore and a responsibility and obligation to hold up than it does that fun spark. And it is part of our job as humans in this world to continue to seek out that spark and to continue to reignite that spark for ourselves. And sometimes that means embracing the joy, regardless of what everybody else says, doing the thing that you most want to do. If you want to write YA, write YA. If you want to write sexy, smutty books, do it. If you want to write stuff that is like uh, unlike anything anyone else is doing, find a way to do it for yourself. If you want to start a subscription, which by the way, <laughs> I have named my subscription and a uh, logo is underway. There's so many fun things happening. So that's coming soon as well. I think you guys are going to love it. There's going to be physical swag that will go out for anyone who signs up. That is going to be cool. You will not want to miss it. So that's going to be super fun. I'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks as well. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, but find the spark, find the thing that gets you excited about it again. And if you can't find that, then take a step back and see if you can recreate it for yourself. Because I think that sometimes when we push, 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 and we get these great results, or we don't get the results or whatever, we start to focus only on the outcome. And the outcome is important. But it's also this, you know, this internal ability to say, this is what I love. And I'm going to lean into that. And this is what, like, I don't want to have to do it this way. And it's not just I'm afraid of doing it this way or I'm resisting doing it way, this way. But sometimes when we have this very clear thought in our head of that is not like intuitively, we know that is not how I want to do this thing. Do it your own way. Like there is room for you to do it your own way and to find joy in the process and to be exactly who you were meant to be in this life and not have to do it like everybody tells you to do it. So hopefully that resonates with some of you. Envy says, do you find that you would give yourself different advice if you didn't have such a solid following? Maybe. I mean, I do think like if I say, if I talk specifically about like posting consistently and other things, there obviously are things that will make you grow faster when it comes to the algorithm, right? But there are also people that literally have 10 YouTube videos up and they have 20 million subscribers because those 10 videos were so viral that they went crazy, right? So it's it's unpredictable to a degree. But I think that almost every single time we betray ourselves and our own joy and our own spark of creativity and intuition to chase the algorithms, we end up regretting it. And that can even be for people who end up making money doing what they've made. Like I've been around in this business for a pretty good amount of time. And I feel like so many of the people that knew they were going against their own values to do something thought at the time, well, I don't care because my bank account XYZ, 
But then over the course of five years or so, they were so burned out or so unhappy or had betrayed themselves to such an extent that they just didn't want to do the business anymore. They lost all their joy because they just killed it basically. And I think, I do think we all give advice from our own perspective. So if I was sitting here and I only had 50 YouTube subscribers instead of, you know, 11,000 and almost 70,000, I, I might give different advice. I might be like, Oh, you got to show up. But I think in the end, it's just a matter of when I, let me, let me put it this way. When I started YouTube, I didn't do it because I thought, oh, I'm going to grow a following of 50,000 or plus subscribers. That was not on my mind at all. It wasn't even a possibility in my head. I just was thinking, I'm so tired of hearing the advice. There's that angel number, two, two, two. I thought, I'm so tired of hearing the advice from people to say, screw writing what you love, just write to market because that's the only way you're going to make any money. You have to be in Kindle Unlimited. There's no other way. You have to write this. You can't write this. And I felt like that advice was so contrary to what I felt was true that I thought I'm going to start a channel where I talk about joy and I talk about how to manage your time and how to manage your emotions and all of this kind of stuff. And I just wanted to make an impact, but I didn't realize that it would lead to the impact that it has led to. But I was coming from such a pure, genuine, vulnerable place of I genuinely want to help. And I'm passionate about this. And I believe strongly that that passion and pouring myself into it is what made it successful, right? Not the fact that I posted every Thursday or that I posted, you know, I didn't post to a niche. I posted planner content and this kind of content and I'm pregnant content. And like who I posted lots of different stuff, which was against what people told me to do, but I just posted from a place of extreme passion. And the same thing was true with my writing that when I first started writing, I was writing what other people told me would sell. And I wasn't really passionate about it. I just wanted to make money and I felt desperate to make it happen. And when I released myself from the need to get a publisher on board and said, well, I'm going to do it myself. I suddenly was like, oh, well, I can just write whatever I want. And when that happened, I started writing what made me passionate, the thing that lit me up from the inside. And that naturally, even though people were like, oh, that's a bad idea, that naturally worked out for me. And I can't speak to what happens and works out for everybody else, but I have noticed a consistent pattern in my life that when I jump into stuff, it's because I'm passionate. But over time, as I begin to get more into the business of it and I start relying on the income and I start, you know, getting into my head about how do I keep growing? How do I keep achieving? There's a loss. It's sort of like the balance begins to get skewed toward the business side. And I start to lose a little bit of that passion and that spark, which then makes me go, what can I do to grow faster again? What can I do to have that same impact I used to have? which is the opposite of what I should be doing. And over the last year or two is what I have really started to realize, okay, I cannot allow myself to <laughs> lose the passion and the spark because that is the thing that ignites the entire impact that I have in the world is just being genuinely myself and showing up from not a place of obligation, but from a place of genuine love and passion and wanting to share and wanting to connect. And, and that is the superpower, not posting every Thursday at you know, 4 PM or whatever. So I, I don't know what the advice would be exactly if I didn't have as big of a follower, but I, I think that or following, but I think in the end, your intuition will lead you to where you need to be. And sometimes the timeline of that can feel very fr frustrating and stressful because it doesn't happen as quickly as we wanted. But so often I think we put the universe in a chokehold and we, we slow the universe down by our desperate desire to see the result when what we need to be focusing on, and this is just purely opinion. So if it doesn't resonate with you, feel free to let it go. But I think that we can, we can stifle our own growth and our own creativity by trying to make it happen when really what is going to make it happen is unleashing that flow within us that says, I'm just going to be myself. Oh, George says better internet. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't gotten a message in a bit that it, it was bad. So I think it's doing better. Thank you, baby. I don't know what you did, but I love you. 
Um, Mark Manson has said, contrarian thinking makes you successful. I've been trying to live that motto a lot recently as I'm basically starting from scratch with a lot of my book writing and publishing. Yeah, I think we've got four minutes left, so I don't want to go too far. Um, I'm not forgetting about you guys on Twitch, but I haven't seen any comment come up that I needed to pull up. So has there been a question? I don't think so. Um, but I, I feel like contrarian thinking can make you successful for sure. Thinking be, but being more true and aligned to yourself is what can really make you the most successful. And a lot of times that is going to be contrarian because it's yours and it's unique and it's a hundred percent who you are. Right. Whereas when we follow the herd and we become just exactly what everybody else is, we don't stand out, right? And that is part of the equation. <laughs> it's already been an hour. I know, this is crazy. And uh, yes, I'm on Twitch too. Um, so hello everyone on both platforms. Thank you for joining me. Um, so anyway, something, this is, this is a simple thing to ignite a spark. I will leave you with this. I realize sometimes, and this, I mean, this is such a simple, like, not selfish, but like shallow thing. But every time I was picking up my Kindle, I had this pink um, cover on it that was dirty. Like it just, it just gathered fingerprints and I don't even know how it got dirty. Just over the years, I've had this for, I don't know, four years or five years and it just got dirty and dirty and dirty. And I just, when I picked it up, I didn't like the way it felt. And I had stickers on the back that were coming up and I just did I didn't realize it, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I wasn't wanting to pick up my Kindle partially for that reason. Also, because I wasn't allowing myself to do stuff that I couldn't multitask. So for $6 on Amazon, I bought this clear cover and I have a bunch of stickers and things that I'm going to put on it. And then I also saw somebody, anybody have a pop socket on their Kindle? <laughs> Um, I saw some people that had a pop socket on their Kindle and I realized I had this really cool, like speaking of these jelly, <laughs> I guess I'm in the mood for these sort of, uh, sparkly glitter things. But George had bought me this two years ago for Christmas and I still have it. Um, so I think I'm going to put this cute little pop socket on here and some new stickers. And it's just sometimes for, for me, bringing the joy and the spark back can be as simple as let me get a new set of pins or let me get a new, um, like, let me grab a pop socket I already had and put it on my Kindle and maybe that'll make me want to pick it up more often. Let me clean my room so that it doesn't feel so, uh, like, cluttered. It feels bright. Let me open the curtains a little bit. Let me put on this shirt that I love that I haven't worn in a while. Let me go and grab my favorite sparkling water. Just anything that lights you up going out in the, yeah, I think that's true. It's like, I need it. It's for me, I'm such a visual person, like a thousand percent a visual person. So having, you know, having it look nice makes me attracted to it. So if I give you a challenge or an encouragement today, hopefully this was not like all over the place message, but if I can give you any encouragement, it's to really just sit and have a think about, oh, I just said that and it makes it sound like true in the rainbow kingdom. Let's have a think true. <laughs> That's what Phoebe's been watching. <gasps> oh, so funny. It gets in your head, the cartoons your kids watch. Um, sit down and have a moment where you think about what is it that truly lights me up right now? What would, if I could just indulge and do something just for me, what would it be? And just truly allow yourself to lean into that and embrace it. And any place where you make an excuse for yourself, where you say, well, I have to post on YouTube today. Cause if I don't, my channel won't grow as fast. Start to ask yourself, is that really true? Like, what if I didn't post this week? What if I posted two videos next week? What if I tried something different? What if I showed up? What if I spent the whole day reading and refilled my well and then did my video tomorrow? But just give yourself that moment to think about what is it I really want and then not allow any of those excuses or other things to get in the way of doing it your way. Even if it's, you know, sunk cost fallacy of like, oh, but I've done, I've spent so much time on this other thing. I can't change and do something different. Start asking yourself, but what if that new different thing is the thing? And what if that lights me up right now? What if I did it? 
Um, also, just as a reminder, oh, the video is up. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> um, so my heart breathings uh, notebook challenge video is up over on YouTube if you want something to do after this. And double down day is tomorrow if you want to come write with us or do reading sprints with us. Um, that is also linked in the description of that video. And uh, if you want to come join us as well, we are doing a scripting challenge like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We are doing a scripting challenge over in our Discord server. There's a new... Um, a new channel called Manifesting Scripting Challenge. And I do an accountability post every day. I have been doing it uh, myself. And I realized synchronicity that every single one of my goals had the number 75 in it. I did not do that on purpose, but I set all these goals of things I wanted to script. And each one of them had the number 75 somewhere in it. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I looked up 75 as an angel number and it says it's uh, an omen that abundance and like a gateway of blessings is on its way to you. And I took that as a <laughs> hell yeah. So I'm very excited for that. <laughs> um, where is that located? Yes, it's in Discord. And you can find a link to the Discord server in the description here on YouTube if you want to come join us. And it's in the six month for life area of the Discord server. So come join us. And if you're not sure what scripting is, come uh, watch, head to the um, last blah. Head to the last coffee chat. Not last week, we didn't have one, but the one before that. It has scripting in the title. And there's actually even a little scripting journal that you can download for free there if you want to use that. Um, so you can definitely come join us. Oh, you were born in 1975, Mary. That's so awesome. Um, so the Double Down Day videos are all on YouTube. Um, I think every single one of them is going to be on YouTube. So if you go to heartbreathings.com and click on writing sprints, you'll see the Google calendar and it'll have links to everybody's YouTube channel. So go join starts first thing in the morning. So it's going to be great. All right. Thank you guys for coming and hanging out with me next Friday release day for disappearance of Vanessa Shaw. I'm so excited. I will be announcing the release date. The book will be out before you know it. It's coming soon. It's coming soon and it's going to be amazing. I feel, I feel it. I'm, I have been working on this to make it the best it can be. And we are almost there. Um, also I will be soon announcing and launching my first ever Ream subscription, which is going to be super, super fun. And it will be a monthly subscription where you will get to read, be the first people to read my new story, a mirror of shadows. So it's going to be fun. All right. <laughs> Ah, I cannot wait. Okay, everybody have an amazing weekend. Monday, I, we, I didn't get to talk about it, but Monday is a total eclipse. I am literally right in the path of total eclipse. I get over four minutes of total eclipse and there are supposed to be like a quarter of a million people joining my town, <laughs> coming into my town. So we will be holed up in our little house here. Um, but if you get to see the eclipse, it can be a very spiritual thing. So make sure you get out there and, um, and, check it out. I'll, I will let you guys know what we're going to be called. I have a name for, um, I have a name for my subscription and it's, it's going to be really fun and it has a secret Easter egg inside the name. So we'll see if anybody can figure it out. All right, you guys, I super love you. I appreciate you every single day. Thank you, um, for hanging out with me and I will see you all next week. All right. Love you. Bye.